Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to this year's uh, L. H. Gordon lecture. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, what this particular audience illustrates is there's still a sizable number of people that realize that central banks are far more important uh, than internet companies. Um, <laughs> And our, our speaker tonight will demonstrate that, no doubt. Um, let me just say a couple of words here. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have uh, Sir, Sir Paul Tucker here. And I want to say just a few words about the Gordon Lecture. Uh, the purpose of the Gordon Lecture is to discuss matters involving the field of finance and public policy uh, with special uh, attention to the internationalization of finance. The prestigious lecture itself represents the interests of Mr. Gordon and leaders in, in finance, business, and universities, public service. Many of you will, will have known him or uh, know of his work. He was a strong presence in the world of finance in the 1920s until his death at the ripe young age of 107 in 2009. He revived the firm of Kidder Peabody after the Wall Street crash in 1929. And then in 1960, Fortune Magazine listed Mr. Gordon as one of the 10 most powerful men on Wall Street as the financial community's most successful underwriter and salesman. Um, the New York Times in 1989 reported that Mr. Gordon had imbued Kidder with an air of positive gentility, giving employees a free hand to pursue deals. Interesting words in today's world. Um, he also gradually sold vacuum uh, ownership of the firm to its workers. Um, and he said to Business Month once, he did not want any him to think of anyone to think of him as that greedy old bastard. Um, <laughs> So as one of the surviving victims, uh, surviving veterans of 1929, he was often asked what he thought, how he thought it had happened. And in 1987, uh, he told The Nation magazine, young men thought they could do anything. Um, interesting words. So um, he was also committed to a world of physical fitness, as was demonstrated by his longevity. But our great get, get, his great gift to us is this lecture in his name. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Larry Summers. Larry Summers is someone who also needs very little introduction. Let me do two things, mention just two or three quick things. Whenever this country, the United States, in the last 20 years or so, has been on, has some economic crisis, some economic challenge, or so forth, somehow or other they ended up calling on Larry Summers. He's one of those people um, who has the same level of stature as central bankers. Um, not one of those people. I think the only such person who has the same level of stature, perhaps. And um, uh, time and again, his wisdom and his thoughtfulness and his courage is, is incredible. Um, he's been everything from the uh, Treasury Secretary to the head of the National Economic Council. He's rescued industries. He's been the uh, chief economist of the IMF uh, and many, many other uh, remarkable features. His most remarkable feature, of course, is that he's also a professor here at Harvard at the Kennedy School. He's head of the Center for Business and Government. And by far, by far, the greatest thing he ever did was select me to be dean of the Harvard Kennedy School. <laughs> so with that, let me turn it over quite modestly to Larry Summers. Thank you uh, very much, uh, David. As I said before, when you made that remark, um, you remind me of what Bill Clinton uh, said when I once introduced him in a very generous way. I explained his many and various financial virtues. Bill Clinton stood up and put that big arm of his around me and said, Larry, you have just illustrated one of my first laws of political life. Whenever possible, be introduced by someone who you appointed to high office. <laughs> and there's clearly an academic corollary, and I am delighted uh, to be introduced uh, by you. But it is my privilege uh, this evening uh, to introduce uh, Paul Tucker. Paul Tucker has held virtually every job there is uh, to have at uh, the Bank of England over a 33-year uh, career that began in uh, 1980 at the Bank of England and ended when he came to Harvard. Uh, last fall in uh, 2013. He has been central on issues of monetary policy. He has been central on issues of uh, regulation. I asked uh, Mervyn King uh, 
the governor of the Bank of England what I should say in introducing Paul. And here are some things he said. <laughs> he probably understands more about central banking than anyone else. He knows about every aspect of that arcane art. And now he will be free to tell the rest of the world what happens behind those high walls. He said something else. Paul's work habits are legendary. Apparently, the time that the emails at the Bank of England rained down um, in the way that got one most soaked was between 12 AM and 3 AM on Mervyn's calculation. And Paul was in touch um, with many phone calls in the morning, but they apparently did not come from his office, but from a local cafe. Uh, Paul has carried on many projects uh, over uh, the years. The one most recently and probably most importantly was the design of a system that would permit a bank that operated in many jurisdictions to be put out of its misery and resolved in the event of its failure. There is no question that is more important for resolving the issue of too big to fail uh, than that question. It has been my great privilege to get to know Paul much better during uh, his than I had before during his time uh, at Kennedy School. There are many central bankers who know a lot about monetary policy and dynamic stochastic general equilibrium. There are few with Paul's breadth of knowledge of philosophy, literature, culture, history, and so much else. And that's why I think we are all in for a treat tonight as Sir Paul Tucker addresses us. Paul. Thank you very much indeed, Larry and, and David. Thank you, Larry, to you and to David Schalstein for sponsoring me here at the Kennedy School and at the Bernie <coughs> School. You've been great um, colleagues. And thank you to Neil for um, putting the idea in my head of coming here um, quite a while ago. I'm going to talk about power. Um, I'm going to talk about unelected power, the power of independent agencies, the concentration of power that um, is now bestowed upon the world's big central banks. It's an extraordinary concentration of power. It disturbs a lot of people. The thinking behind what I'm going to say um, was very much in my mind as we redesigned the Bank of England, which has certainly accrued an enormous amount of, of power. If you ask people in metropolitan London, the commentariat, whether they're comfortable with the Bank of England's current functions, um, they will say yes. If you ask the same group of people whether they are comfortable with the Bank of England's power, they will say no. Um, more or less the same is true on the continent of Europe uh, with the ECB, perhaps even more so. And in, in different ways, it's true here um, as well. <clears throat> Before continuing, let me first of all start with a question. Um, so the consensus around independent central banks is deeply embedded <clears throat> and now global. When and where do you think the following was said? So this is a genuine question to the audience. Central banks should be free from political pressure. In countries where there is no central bank, one should be established. Any ideas? Neil? I'll have a crack. Uh, it's early 1900s, and it's in the United States. Not bad. It's in the early 1920s. It's after the First World War. It wasn't just the United States, it's the world. Um, it was in a commission commissioned by the League of Nations for the design of the new world, and they were absolutely committed to central banking independence. 
<clears throat> to whom was this advice um, given? We, the Treasury, have neither claim to be consulted nor power to enforce our views on the central bank, identity withheld. It is not desirable that we should have any such claim. To which figure was that advice given? Someone other than me has got to have a guess. Andre. Not, not actually, I shall come to Richard Nixon. He's quite a problematic character in this story. Um, it's the Churchill. Um, in the 1920s, and Churchill got very fed up um, indeed um, with the Bank of England, with the central bank in, in question. And around this time, um, Neil's guess was, was, was good. Um, these institutions were riding high, and that's why I want to recollect um, this. Uh, Montague Norman, who was probably the most prominent central banker of the day, was responsible for implementing the gold standard, the safety of the banking system, the allocation of credit with his colleague Benjamin Strong in New York. They really did describe the, the world with partners in continental Europe and followers, in fact, um, in Asia. And this absolutely came to an end in the early 1930s. It came to a complete um, end um, for all sorts of reasons. <clears throat> policy mistakes, um, an overreach of power. In the UK's case, the Bank of England, Montague Norman being seen as bullying the government to balance its um, budget to go back onto the gold standard at an ill-judged um, parity. But here, too, um, the Federal Reserve's wings were very severely um, clipped. And I think it's worth remembering the fragility um, of independent institutions, which only a few years ago, the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations, had embedded in what would then have been called, I don't know, the London Consensus. It wasn't quite the Washington um, Consensus. Go forward um, a bit and think about how powerful central banks are today. And I'm going to give you two quotes, both of which are before the crisis, and each of which therefore doesn't take account of the accumulation of firm power. So one's from the left, one's from the right. So from the left, Kathleen um, McNamara, who very few central bankers have read, um, which is a mistake, um, because she is an articulate critic of the democratic deficit um, which accompanies independent, unelected power. And she sees this, she's, she has less um, Highfalutin ways of making the same point, but she sees this as part of a neoliberal project. Independent central banks solidify a specific set of ideologies and plot around positions which favor certain groups in society over others. The values at the core of the delegation are neoliberal. Um, skip to the neoliberals. Uh, Milton Freeman on um, central bankers in a letter to Stan Fisher. Um, this is quoted in um, a piece that Sam wrote that I haven't that, 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 that been edited, I think. The two most important variables in their loss function, in other words, what they care about, are avoiding accountability on the one hand and achieving prestige um, on the other. So, you know, this is, this is well-balanced um, antagonism um, to central bankers. But let's, central bankers are perhaps the epitome There is a big debate in this country going back some decades, um, starting in the UK and the European Union over the past 20 years or so, about the administrative state, about the regulatory state, about the power, um, the unaccountable power of unelected agencies or agencies led by unelected people. And it's worth remembering where sovereign power began. Sovereign power began quite a long time ago. Um, with all power um, held to the breast of the king in his chamber. Um, the king decided taxes, the king led his armies into battle, um, the king was in charge of the propagation of information, and the king was in charge of minting the coin of the realm. And the great struggle um, in Europe, inherited and 
codified by this country, is partly about the peeling off of those powers from a unique sovereign. So taxes um, are grabbed by Parliament. This is, in some respect, the greatest constitutional moment in Europe in the past thousand years. Um, kings delegate the leading of their armies to a professional military. <clears throat> the propagation of information becomes entirely privatized, or at least, as in the UK, in an arm's length um, public broadcasting corporation, and the coin of the realm gets delegated to the central um, bank. Now, just reflect for a second um, on the US. Economist perception, I've realized over the past six months, of people, of US citizens, of parliamentary democracies is that the Prime Minister is all-powerful. Um, that's not remotely the case, depends most other things on the size of the majority. From the other side of the Atlantic, um, I think people understand perfectly well that there is a tension inscribed into a constitution that separates the executive government under the President from the legislature and the Congress. What is not um, appreciated widely at all is the struggle that any president um, faces to assert his or her control over the executive um, branch. And thus we see over the past 30 or 40 years, starting with Reagan and then taken forward by Clinton, a much greater use of executive orders um, to impose his power on non-independent agencies within the executive um, branch, and with slight attempts to extend it occasionally too. Um, the executive branch. There are nice exchanges of letters between Cass Sunstein and Ben Bernanke about whether or not the Federal Reserve will actually take account of the spirit of various executive orders that have been dispatched by the current um, president. And this is regarded um, as a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon where people sit on the political slash constitutional um, spectrum. So the former dean of the law school here, now Supreme Court Justice, Eleanor Kagan, she thinks it's a terrific thing. There are other people who think that delegating, Congress delegating power to anybody other than the person of the president or perhaps a named um, cabinet um, minister is a dreadful thing um, to do. And there are some people, another group, who worry um, in a different dimension <coughs> that the whole separation of powers has been undermined by the creation of regulatory agencies that write rules and check compliance and then enforce lack of compliance, um, which was where the separation of powers um, began. And the legal scholars in this room know better than me that there is a vast literature on this engaged, partisan, learned, um, and real, played out through the, um, through the courts. But it's not only here. It's happened in, in Europe as, as well. Going back to the um, 1980s and certainly by the 1990s, there was something called the New Public Management, um, which I think began in New Zealand and Australia. Um, and it swept through um, Europe. And the idea was um, that the efficacy, the efficiency, the effectiveness of the state apparatus could be improved by separating the determination of policy which would rest with ministers accountable to Parliament on the one hand from the implementation of that policy, um, which would be handed over to um, agencies. And, and what's more, that each agency should have only one function so that the public and the Parliament can observe how they are doing with that um, single function. That will have some resonance for central banking later, later on. Um, and this hasn't worked. This hasn't worked um, because it, it can only possibly work if you can draw a nice line between policy um, and implementation, both in principle and in practice. And there are certainly cases where you probably could draw the line in principle, but people um, forgot to. This is a problem on both sides of the Atlantic. There are independent agencies in this country that have objectives like pursue the public interest, um, and then given a set of, of powers. Um, that drives people mad. There are um, agencies in the 
okay um, where the implementation decisions that the agency has to take, which may be in, um, in the medical sphere, for example, involve value um, judgments, and therefore um, they do politics if they truly decide. This has been um, described by an independent think tank in London, the Institute for Government, as an accountability quagmire. It is no longer clear um, in London what ministers are truly accountable for um, on the floor of the House, which is kind of a rather fundamental violation of what was meant to be the UK's um, constitution. So there's an awkwardness <coughs> here. Um, at the very least, there is an awkwardness in implementation, in independent agencies being set up without sufficient care and precision about whether there should be delegation and how there should be um, delegation. Now, Alberto Alessina, who's one of the three people I should acknowledge as being really helpful to me in thinking about this, um, the other two are Adrian Vermula in the law school here and Philip Petit, a political philosopher um, at Princeton. Um, Alberto did some work with Tabellini that um, grinds out some normative principles about when or whether one should delegate. Um, the goal can be specified, society's preferences are reasonably stable, um, there's a problem with making credible commitments to stick to a policy regime, the technical nature of the field makes it hard for the electorate to monitor political decision takers, and rather crucially, there are no forced first order trade-offs for distributional um, issues. I think this is a pretty good list of um, principles for what it's worth. Um, I know for a fact that it was not weighed um, by the UK government very often over the last 25 years in deciding in particular cases whether to delegate. It was in the case of central banking. But what it doesn't do, what it doesn't do, I think it's terrific at what it aims to do, but what it doesn't do is say anything about how um, to delegate. Now, at this point, it will probably be helpful if um, I defined what I think an independent agency is. So I'm going to define an independent agency as follows, and I apologize for not having a slide on this. A public agency that is free to deploy its instruments in pursuit of a public policy goal, insulated from short-term political considerations, influence, or direction, but accountable for its stewardship of the regime. Now, if you define it like that, there is a problem um, with agencies, including agencies in this country, which um, replicate party politics on the commission. We can think of them, some of them, the SEC, but there are lots and lots of these things that replicate um, party politics on the, um, amongst the commissioners, so there'd be a 3-2 split or a 4-3 split, and in the fields I know, I absolutely promise you, this affects um, policy making in um, these institutions. And to the extent that they're run like that, I don't quite understand myself why they are independent decision takers rather than advisors um, giving advice publicly, um, technical advice publicly, um, to real politicians, um, elected politicians, um, rather than having unelected party um, politically partisan. So at the very least, we seem to have, um, this is an expression I owe to Adrian Muller, first order independence and second order independence, and I'm most interested in first order um, independence. And I'm going to suggest some design principles or precepts for how you set up um, such <coughs> an agency. And these are going to seem completely innocuous, um, as Adrian pointed out to me, and that's good. Um, because if people can agree to things, that's nice, especially when it turns out that there is almost no agency on either side of the Atlantic that fulfills the criteria. Um, and actually what I would like to see in the real world, and what I would personally do if I was in Congress or a parliament somewhere, is I would want my improved version um, of these principles or design precepts to be taken up by um, the General Accounting Office or the National Audit Office in the UK, 
um, or the equivalent in the European Parliament, and an audit done of all of the key um, independent agencies to see whether they um, more or less um, comply. What I'm going to do after having discussed them <laughs> is say something about whether or not these principles stack up under different conceptions about politics or democracy, and then going to start talking about central banking um, in particular as a case that first appears to do well and then appears to do badly. So what are the principles? First of all, um, a statement of purposes um, and goals and powers and a delineation of boundaries. Notice the delineation of boundaries. These, it seems to me, should come from the legislature by and large. If the executive branch delegates something, that's on a whim. It can take it back um, overnight if it wishes. Only the legislature can um, truly um, delegate. Um, secondly, there should be principles for how, how the agency will conduct itself within its boundary operating um, principles, giving reasons for its um, decisions. Um, the field I came from, central banking, um, Montague Norman's period, he actually said to the deputy governor, one of my predecessors, said to Parliament, um, we're doomed once we start to give reasons. Actually, um, the opposite is the case. You're not to be condemned unless you give um, reasons, because how can you be legitimate um, otherwise? Because thirdly, you need to be sufficiently transparent to enable the agency and the regime, that's, that's a very important point that I'll come back to, to be monitored and held accountable by elected um, politicians. And then fourth, and this is in some respects the biggest problem um, in many fields, what procedure or process will be followed when the agency sticks up against the boundaries um, of its delegated powers during a crisis, should it just make things up itself and save the world? A robustness test, and I, and I, for the next one, what I'm going to say, I, know, I claim no special expertise whatsoever. My, my goal in what I'm about to say now, and in the paper I've written accompanying this, is to provoke people more expert than me to carry out a robustness test. Because the criteria that Alessina sets out and those that I set out for how to delegate, these should stack up. But for, for these agencies to be legitimate, these principles have to stack up under the most exacting theory of our democracies um, that we can find, um, and that are regarded as reasonable in today's world. And we're talking about delegation in a representative democracy. We're talking about double um, delegation. We're not talking about Rousseau's um, assembly. Um, it's hard to see. Um, there are fans of Rousseau in this country, um, but actually it's uh, fans of Rousseau in this town. But actually, it's, it's hard to conceptualize any type of executive government um, under, the, under Rousseau's um, views of the state. So putting that to one side. So the weakest test, this would be Schumpeter's thing, uh, is simple majority voting. If Congress or Parliament have voted for um, the agency for it to be independent, that's that. Um, entirely procedural um, notion of legitimacy. Um, derived from electing um, the representatives in the first place. Uh, most people would go further than that these days. They would at least want um, there to be the rule of law and sufficient information um, for there to be um, reason and debate on what Parliament or Congress um, were doing. Um, and that, that, will, um, that will be enough, the rule of law in particular, will be enough to generate challenge if the agency steps beyond um, its boundaries. So there is a substantive difference from the Schumpeterian um, position there. But there's a problem, I think. I don't think that is the most exacting conception. There is a problem, in particular for agencies whose whole point is to solve a time and consistency problem, since you cannot do that unless the agency is going to be durable. Um, and so if you make, let's say, the central bank independent and there is a firm expectation that the opposition will get in at the next 
um, general election and they will revoke um, independence, they have done very much to solve the problem of critical commitment that you were trying to solve. And believe it or not, this was a real life consideration in the UK in 1998 um, when the Labour government, 1997, 98, when the Labour government, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, announced that they were making the Bank of England independent. Um, the Tory opposition um, announced that they would oppose it. And they did oppose it in the House of Commons. And on more than one occasion, and for those of you who knew Eddie George, you will recognize this, he said to me, it was the finger, it's the finger that you will recognize, don't take this for granted until there is a change of chancellor, a change of um, prime minister, and a change of party in government who also supports um, independence. Now, as it happens, Labour were in power for 15 years and the Tories had had time to change their mind. Um, what would have happened if they had been elected in 2002 um, is not clear. But what this suggests is that you need not only bipartisan support, but you actually need broad public support. You need public debate um, around at least certain um, independent agencies, those who cannot perform their functions unless they are going to um, endure. This is actually closer to the conception of politics represented by the, the so-called neo-republicans. Um, now, this isn't very far away, actually, it turns out, from how we thought about it in the Bank of England. So another quote, remember that the Bank of England lost its independence and then regained it about 60, 70 years later. Um, this is one of my predecessors in 1990. When the public debate about independence was going on, I suppose, um, but well before any political party had declared that it would give Bank of England independence. This is George Blunden, for those of you who knew him. Uh, my ideal as a publicly responsible central bank entrusted with effectively maintaining the stability of the currency, but in a society where such stability is generally desired, where inflation is recognized as a deadly sin, and where government is dedicated to price stability, and this wasn't some offhand comment. This was the last paragraph, literally the last paragraph and last sentence of the last speech he gave after a 40 year um, career. <clears throat> I think what he was trying to do was give those of us that were continuing an instruction. Um, so let me start now to talk about central banking in particular. And it will be obvious by now that most of my examples are coming from the US or the UK. And that isn't just because I know more about the US and the UK. It's for two reasons. First of all, the UK's political constitution is regarded by many as the opposite of the US's. And secondly, that the other great central bank in the Western world, the ECB, <coughs> is part of an altogether more complicated political constitution. To bring in federalism would just be um, um, a stretch to um, so the question, the first question as we get to the content of central banking is where does price stability fit under um, political theory? Again, thinking about two types of political theory, liberalism uh, or liberal theory, and I, I, I mean value-free um, liberalism. I mean liberalism in an abstract sense. This can be conservative or progressive. Now, Alan Greenspan's definition of price stability works absolutely terrifically with this, which of course isn't that much of a surprise when economic agents no longer take account of the prospective change in the general price level in their economic decision um, taking. Um, this absolutely fits with the liberal idea of freedom of non-interference. Um, Republican theorists want to go further. They, will, they, they, they don't think non-interference is enough. They want um, non-domination. The very possibility that the state could tax away nominal wealth is a problem for them, even if they don't do so. They want some stakes in the ground to stop that happening. Um, and so the Republicans, they will want, um, they will want institutions that guarantee this. It won't be enough that, that um, elected governments choose not to do it. Republicans will want institutions that embed this um, in some way. Now this leads to extravagant claims in my view. So James Buchanan, um, 
his essays scattered over many decades um, towards the end of his life um, on the need for a monetary constitution. Um, something analogous to the independent judiciary seems required, but bound by the parameters set out in the monetary constitution. He explicitly saw um, the monetary agency um, as a fourth branch, ranking right up there. There are others, many others, who see independent agencies generally as comprising a fourth um, branch. Um, there, is a, there is a debate in this country about so-called um, so super statutes, um, stemming partly from legal scholars in Yale and in New York. The problem with it is that they generate such a long list of statutes that almost anything that affects the fabric of day-to-day -day life in a profound way turns out to be a super statute. I'm going to suggest a better definition of a constitutional statute from a country that many people think doesn't have a constitution, although of course the UK does. And this is the president of the Supreme Court um, in 2010. In fact, he's quoting um, a judge one layer below from 2003. A constitutional statute is one that conditions the legal relationship between citizen and state in a general overarching manner, or enlarges or diminishes the scope of fundamental constitutional rights. They then go on to list some things that in a UK context they think fulfill the criteria for being a constitutional statute, and it's quite a grand list. Uh, Magna Carta. 1689 Bill of Rights, the Reform Act that extended the franchise in the 19th century, the European Communities Act in the 1970s. Well, you know, independent central banks don't exactly square up with any of that, do they? So we can, we can kick well beyond touch the idea, I think, um, that central banks are some fourth branch in some deep, um, deep sense. But nevertheless, nevertheless, um, there is something important about central bank independence and the separation of power. Let's go back to our king. Our king is holding all of those powers to himself. The preferred power that is truly wrenched from him is the power to tax. That's what parliaments are in some deep um, sense. Well, be able to control the printing press does give you the power to tax via the inflation um, tax. I would argue that Congress, that once you move from um, something like gold standard specie money to um, fiat money, then actually Congress, Parliament, the legislature should want to set up an independent central bank as its agent so as to protect itself and the people from the executive branch abusing the power to tax, a power that is meant to reside um, with Parliament and Congress, not with the um, executive. So much for high uh, theory. I think that last point, by the way, is tremendously um, important. What about the real um, world? Here's a shocking thing. Um, 1970s. Aftermath of the Vietnam War, aftermath of the breakdown of Bretton Woods. Um, Art Burns is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, um, quite close to Nixon, who'd known him for a long time. Um, and we know about what I'm going to say bits of the Nixon tapes. People, of course, on the whole aren't interested in these bits of the Nixon tapes, but they're quite useful for my purpose, and they're quite shocking. Nixon and Burns have a series of conversations about how Burns is going to manage monetary policy to aid Nixon's re-election campaign. The worst quote that I've come across is Burns himself saying, time is getting short, we want to get this economy going. I respond to that um, as two people, as someone who spent their professional life um, as a central banker trying to get independence, getting it, one's just dismayed um, by it. As a citizen, I think it is absolutely disgraceful because at no point did Burns say to the people or to Congress that he was surrendering the Federal Reserve's um, independence to the president. Who the hell did he think he was? Um, when we debate what it is to be an independent 
<coughs> what it is to have an elective power. It isn't just about, my God, um, do we accept that they should have that power? It is then absolutely vital that they don't give that to some interest group, in this case, um, the president, or the financial sector, or the agricultural um, sector. I don't know if there's an example quite as bad as that in the UK, but there are some pretty bad examples. Um, they're not quite as bad because it was overt that the government were in charge of monetary policy. I can remember John Major when Prime Minister being on tour in India and the opinion polls weren't very good and so he phoned up Norman Lamont, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, and ordered an interest rate cut of 50 basis points. Um, Norman was absolutely apoplectically livid having fallen out of the ERM. I do genuinely believe that Norman Lamont at this point wanted to do the right thing but John had an election to, to win. Um, many people in the room, particularly those of you that are younger, won't have heard of um, John Major and Norman Lamont. I think you will have heard of Margaret Thatcher. Um, this is the late 1980s. This is recorded in Nigel Lawson's book. Um, but actually, I was private secretary for the government of the Bank of England at the time. And I can vouch safe to this being accurate because somebody who was in the room told me it the following day. So Lawson goes to see Thatcher and says, you know, it's all terrible, we're not doing very well, we're defeating inflation, uh, we ought to make the Bank of England independent. This is before ERM entry, for those of you that um, are economists. And Thatcher says, to hand over responsibility for monetary policy would look as if the government were admitting that, after all, it was unable to bring inflation down itself, which would be highly damaging um, politically. How on earth? scientists have written, come up with all sorts of explanations. Um, the best one, I think, although as written, um, is only attributed to emerging market countries, is, well, you might need to protect yourself from the international capital markets. And this is sort of a Max, Maxwell's book, and it's kind of presented slightly as a plot, and it's presented um, slightly as partisan. And I think that's to miss a big point. In a world where um, there is no price stability, or it's very weak, the nominal anchor is very weak, inflation will tend to be volatile, um, all the covariances will go in the wrong, the things one cares about will go in the wrong direction, there is a risk premium, or there isn't just compensation for a high level, high rate of expected inflation, there is a risk premium as well. Saving this risk premium is a good thing to do. The day the Bank of England was made independent, um, long deal deals fell by over forward rates, sorry, fell by over 50 basis points. The decomposition suggests that about half of that was the inflation risk premium. That is approaching 10% of the yield on medium to long term index bonds at the time. At the time. This is a very big saving, and it is completely unpartisan. If you are from the left, you can spend more. If you are from the right, you can offer your um, um, interest groups around the country um, tax cuts. Um, that doesn't get the central the, the politicians to do it, but I think actually it is partly why Gordon Brown did it, and it's why he did it on um, day, day one of the new um, government in 1997. Now, at this point, I'm going to make a big leap so as to get to um, how I think institution, these institutions stack up today. And I want to illustrate a big change of opinion. Um, over time and cross-sectionally, essentially an intellectual battle, the battle of ideas, was won. So in the late 1930s, one of the great high priests of um, liberalism, delegation to an administrative authority with substantial discretion with power must be invoked sparingly if democratic institutions are to be preserved. It is utterly inappropriate in the money field. Um, early 1990s, Larry, institutions can do the work of rules. Our monetary rules should be avoided. Why? Because they all turn out um, to be subject to instability and the unpredictability of the world. Instead, in 
went. One of the big debates is how on earth can you make these institutions work? Um, first of all, why don't they just get repealed? If you um, appoint a conservative central banker, why don't they get fired? Um, if you have a contract, why does anyone bother to um, enforce it? And I really do think the political scientists have a lot to contribute to, um, to this. I mean, institutions work, monetary institutions work, when day to day they are held to count monitored by all sections of society an active debate about what they're doing when their goals are clear enough for people to monitor what they're doing um, when the exception clauses are clear enough for people to debate whether it's a legitimate exception or whether they um, are cheating um, or not and that's where everybody ended up the literature suggested that transparency was a good thing because it would help people Actually, it turned out to be true. It was also a good thing because it enabled the political or the small debate um, about these powerful institutions to be going on all the time. It's what lends legitimacy to the central bank, and it's only with legitimacy that the other central bankers in the room that you have the balls to do unpopular things. You don't do unpopular things if you think um, that are a kind of approaching, but still within the boundaries of your mandate. So, how did the monetary regime stack up before the crisis? Well, on a narrow conception of the monetary regime, this is you know, just trying to achieve low and stable inflation pretty well, better in some countries than others. The goals were specified. Sometimes they were left to the central bank to flesh out, as here, which I think is a mistake. Um, the operating principles, the central banks became better and better at articulating them. Um, they were transparent about what they were doing, and there was an active debate um, in financial markets in Parliament amongst political commentators about what they were doing. It wasn't quite so clear what they were doing in emergencies, but that was um, that was thought. People didn't really um, envisage the scale of emergency that might occur until perhaps the early um, zeros. And of course, this was tempting the gods. Um, Bob Woodward, um, on Alan Greenspan, Maestro. I can remember cringing when I heard the um, um, titles of the book. There's only one thing you need to know in public office, and that's that the gods exist. Um, and I'm completely serious. Um, where the gods really get you is when you were warned by the great leaders of your own profession. Um, Paul Volcker, in 1989, date is significant. Um, Arthur Burns, gave the equivalent lecture at the end of his term, and he titled it The Anguish of Central Banking. And well, he might have done. Um, a decade later, having slayed the inflation dragon in this country against um, we know, lukewarm support at time from the Reagan administration, Paul Walker gave a lecture which bears rereading um, the triumph of central banking, question mark. I insist that neither monetary policy nor the financial system will be well served if a central bank in or influences or influence over the financial system. Um, you, can, you can think about putting those two quotes together. So how does monetary policy stack up during the crisis? And by the way, it's going to get worse. Well, in terms of purposes and powers, purposes at least, not badly, still trying to achieve price stability, stabilize demand to ensure that it grows or travels with supply. Um, lack of precision in the short-term trade-off between those things. In this country especially, the dual mandate is, is what lawyers or philosophers would call an interpretive concept. It's why presidents and senate are so interested in the preferences of the people that lead the Fed. This is a flaw um, in the system. Being made up as they go along um, by 
Um, transparency and accountability were well, quite hard when no one really understands the instruments that you are inventing that day and emergencies when it isn't clear who can approve what. And everybody gets frightfully angry about that. This isn't a criticism, by the way. I was part of that innovation. Um, one example, I spent my 50th birthday um, arranging to lend half a trillion um, sterling to the banking system in ways that would create the least alarm possible. Um, it worked actually for a while, uh, only for a while. Um, when you get to the other um, functions, it, it gets much worse. And notice what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm now introducing other functions for the first time. And my God, what's going on is that people are remembering all of a sudden that there are other functions and no one's bothered to talk about them for a long time. So Thomas Humphrey of the Richmond um, Fed, it's always good to have internal critics. Um, the Fed has deviated from the classical model of lender of last resort in so many ways as to make a mockery of the notion that it is a lender of last resort. This is quite some combination. Um, so the Fed has done too much and it has acted unconstitutionally. Uh, there is a wide body of commentary out there with exactly um, that point of view and it drove, it drove certain provisions of the Dodd-Frank um, the Federal Reserve's powers. In the other direction, um, this is UK. This is the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, about the Bank of England. I could not in practice order the bank to do what I wanted. Independence had a downside as well as an upside. He thought the Bank of England leadership was slow and too um, conservative. My, my point is not tonight to take a substantive view on any of that. It's that this is this is absolutely inconsistent with legitimacy. You cannot, you cannot be so powerful. In a crisis, it's okay for a while, but you cannot sustain your legitimacy into peacetime um, when um, people that are supposedly expert and have been close to policy have such divergent views on where the boundaries of, in that case, the lender of last resort function um, begin and end. So how do the other functions stack up? Liquidity um, insurance, lender of last resort. Well, the purpose was okay. Was okay. Let's um, contain the crisis. But there were really any operating principles. Um, Parliament and Congress were very angry about how on earth they could hold anyone to account. And by definition, um, there was neither a substantive nor a procedural um, contingency um, plan. Um, the same was true of prudential policies. This seemed to me. Um, unavoidable since prudential policies completely collapsed in a heap. It was inevitable that they were going to be um, rewritten. This is more important for the future. The most controversial area is credit policy, as I'll come on to. Um, so the Federal Reserve starts steering the mortgage market. The UK subsidizes lending, first of all, to the mortgage market and then small firms, the ECB, who knows what they're about to um, do. They're choosing between all of these bad, um, bad things. Um, this is Fine in crisis, it's completely intolerable unless it's solved. Um, some countries have made more progress than others. This country hasn't made much progress um, in solving those problems. Let me say a few words quickly about um, each of them. Um, so the good news, and this is particularly good news when one recalls the critics from the left, is that it turned out that central bankers weren't inflation nutters who cared about um, inflation in the short run more than they cared about demand and jobs. Indeed, they were able to provide hugely more monetary stimulus than any elected government would conceivably have been able to provide because the nominal, the medium term nominal anchor held. This is one of the most significant points about monetary policy to come out of the crisis. On the other hand, um, remember um, Alberto's principles, um, no trade-offs, no first-order trade-offs with distributional choices. Well, there are certainly distributional effects. Um, if you're a saver or a pensioner, you haven't done very well out of um, the, during this period of extraordinary monetary accommodation. Um, that may not be a killer blow to independence. Savers are effectively investors in the future prosperity of the country. Getting the country back on its feet is in their interests too. But nevertheless, few central banks have have written about this um, at all. 
And let me give you an example of, which may seem trivial, but I don't think it is in terms of where independence begins and ends. So quantitative easing, the narrowest conception of it, involves buying medium to long maturity government bonds, um, central bank bonds. Um, and what that will do is that it will pull down um, the long bond rate. And it's quite important that the Treasury uh, or the Treasury debt managers don't undo what you're doing because they have an incentive to lengthen the maturity and duration um, of, their, um, of their issuance of the stock of debt. Um, and what this shows is that unless you cooperate, unless you coordinate, um, you have a conflict between two policies. And what, in a big sense, what this underlines is that when you get to the zero bound and you do QE, independence doesn't mean quite what it meant um, before. Now, two facts. So in the US, um, and Joshua there he is, has documented this um, in the US. I knew it already, um, as it happens. The US, the US Treasury did um, lengthen the maturity and duration of its debt. Which is, um, which is quite a thing, actually. Um, in the UK, we did something else. Um, in 2004, both Merlin King and I spoke about um, this and said, well, if ever we did get to the zero bound and did QE, um, there would have to be an agreement with the government that they would not change their debt management strategy. And lo and behold, at the beginning of 2009, there was a published exchange of letters And their debt management strategy had been sufficiently stable that people could have observed it in the market had they done so. Um, the point here isn't a kind of cheap crack at the, um, the US, although I would kind of make a serious crack at the Fed. Um, it's that the conception of independence changes. You absolutely have to cooperate and coordinate. What matters is who is in charge of deciding the amount of money um, that's being pumped into the economy and that it is still being decided on the basis of an inflation target or something like that, rather than with some other goal. But all of those things, none of those things, they're all lessons, you know, not many people foresaw them, I certainly didn't. They require repair rather than the redrawing of boundaries around monetary policy. I don't think that's true when we get to some of the other um, things. The, the, the main accusation against the Fed, and as I've said, the opposite accusation is, is made to the Bank of England, um, but the accusation against the Fed at its worst is that it failed at bus firms, um, firms that it should have known to be insolvent. And just as we have in monetary policy a cardinal principle of no monetary financing, we need to reaffirm the cardinal principle of the defender of last resort that there will be no lending to insolvent firms. Making a reality of that um, would take me into too much detail, but I think that the Fed have to um, commit to that. Um, but the big point here is simply that a regime needs to be um, decided, and decided with Congress, in this country, Parliament, um, with government, so that people know where they stand. And implicit in what I'm saying is that I personally don't support a regime where the central bank is free um, to go beyond any accepted boundaries and save the world. Um, I think it's quite convenient to save the world. And I think the Federal Reserve could have saved the world by staying inside its boundaries on them. But I think as a normative principle for legitimacy, um, the boundaries ought to be clear. People can't be blamed for exceeding boundaries that haven't been well um, defined. Let me make two um, further quick points. The biggest accretion of power comes from central banks being in the supervisory business again. Um, banking stability. I think that in degree this is unavoidable. If society is to allow fractional reserve banking, um, then monetary stability has to include um, stability of the deposit money system alongside um, price stability. And I don't think that means that central banks necessarily have to have de jure responsibility, but they can't be completely um, out of that. But there should be some boundaries. I don't think they should be responsible for consumer protection or competition policy issues more structural um, policies, and they should find ways of being more transparent about what they do so that they can be held to account. Believe me, if you go around the world, 
there'll be central banks with some or all of those um, functions that I think should lie outside of central banking, but I think that will eventually get them into um, trouble. The most explosive of all is credit policy. Um, if, you, if you take risk, you can take losses. Um, the losses go to the government one way or another. If you allocate credit, then you are getting into distributional um, issues and doing a form um, of fiscal policy. Now, going ahead, looking to the future, it, the question is asked, um, should central banks be doing this kind of thing in steady state? I think they have to adopt a principle of parsimony, parsimony that they will use the fewest instruments possible to um, achieve the goals that they are set by the legislature, because that can be more easily monitored. I also think that the world has to come clean that there is an overlap between central banking and government in the fiscal sphere. They can take losses, the losses are transmitted. They do do things all the time that affect the allocation of credit. I would like to see um, what I call a fiscal carve out. Um, that would set some of the boundaries. Society should um, decide where those boundaries um, are. So the principle of this is these aren't philosopher kings, they're not maestros or celebrities, they're not the nation's chief economists as, the, they, as they were described um, on both sides of the Atlantic before and after the um, crisis. They are tremendously important, but only with boundaries that should come from the legislature um, after proper public debate and sustained mm -hmm. over time. And so are they Hamiltonian, Jeffersonian, or Madisonian um, institutions? Um, well, they're all three, um, and in a way it's kind of, it's very interesting the extent to which people in this country, scholars, will line up uh, um, behind one conception um, of the operation of the state. Well, these institutions, not only central banks, but um, other independent agencies, they are sites of centralized power, they are Hamiltonian in that sense. Um, but on my argument, they can only possibly sustain themselves legitimately if there is broad public debate and an element of enduring popular um, support, um, that's Jeffersonian. And they are not a fourth branch. They have to be accountable um, to the courts, the executive through appointments, and to Congress most profoundly for what they do. Um, and that is Madison's separation of, of powers. Let me say one final thing. I think that many people um, who would identify themselves as critics of the right of executive government and independent agencies would agree with me that there need to be boundaries. They would disagree probably about where the boundaries should be placed. And I think we would do well if we could get the debate to a position, to a place where it is about where the boundaries are rather than whether there are any boundaries. There's a function that it seems to me central banks perform, and that is quasi-agreed that they perform, that I'm not precisely sure I understand how it fits into your framework. And that is, there's stuff that needs to be done that politicians want to have done without their taking responsibility for it being done. Because if it is done, it will be bad for them politically. That we were, in 1994, essentially urged by members of Congress in both parties to ignore congressional or to push the limit of congressional authority and use the Exchange Stabilization Fund to bail out Mexico. 
because they wanted Mexico bailed out, but they didn't want to take responsibility for it because there are a class of things for which every member of Congress has the same preference, which is that they vote against it and it pass. And one solution to that problem is to have these institutions around who will act and be blamed. And you know, there's similar things with respect to providing ransom. You can think about it in other contexts besides central banking. But I wonder how that function fits with uh, your theories of the role of central banks in democratic societies. Well, not very well, really. Um, the, for, for two reasons. First of all, it's an equilibrium which if one acquiesces all the time, then Congress or Parliament are encouraged always to take that position and the central bank will um, always find itself acting as the fiscal authority. You might say, I don't mean you, Larry, but one might say um, that doesn't matter as long as the central bank survives to fight another day. Well, there's certainly some people in the um, room know at the end of this current crisis, the Federal Reserve had angered parts of Congress sufficiently that on some fronts, Turns out that there are limits to the tolerance of, of, of Congress for this. But, but the more positive way of putting it is central banks and treasuries can get themselves into a better place with Parliaments and Congress by talking much more openly about the kinds of things that they can, in principle, do um, in advance. And So there are some central bankers in this country, and I completely disagree with them, who object to the provision of Dodd-Frank that says the Federal Reserve should consult the Treasury Secretary and the President um, before conducting certain operations um, in the future. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing um, at all. It's the kind of procedural um, uh, provision um, which brings in an elected politician and makes them a You believe, you really believe that. Um, I mean, I am, I determinately am non-transparent with respect to my makeup examination policy. Because I can't really announce the policy, which is that they're makeup exams because you want one. And I can't really announce the policy, which is I'll never give a makeup exam because in the end, when the claim is sufficiently compelling, I will. So I, on the first day of class, act hostile, act, act vaguely hostile to make up exams, and then sort of see how it goes, and thereby preserve my credibility and deal with situations as they arise reasonably. Seems to me that if once every, seems to me it's part of the design of the system that once every 40 years or so, there'll be an emergency, that the Federal Reserve will do something that's kind of off the program, that it won't have warned people about in advance, that everybody will yell and scream a little bit, that for a few years they'll get their wings clipped, and life will go on for another 40 years. But it's not every 40 years, is it? The example you gave is 20 years ago, and actually less than 20 years to, um, to the next example, and you and I could probably both name some examples in between. And if a Republican administration were to be returned next time and control both the House and the Senate, um, I think there are lots of people that would be very concerned that there would be legislation that would trim the Federal Reserve very considerably. Um, now, it, so I think that the difference between us, and there, there is a bit of a, um, a difference, is to what extent is this like a series of one-shot games where everyone gets one game before the next game comes around. And if it is like that, you're right. And if it's not like that, um, you're wrong, in my view. And I suppose where I betray a, um, a fiscal 
must sound professional, is what happened in the 1930s. Um, there is no doubt the central banks needed trimming back in the 1930s. They were too powerful. Um, they did not need to be completely shut down um, to the point where the Fed and President Truman virtually went to war with each other in the late 1940s, early 1950s, with, with Truman accusing the then leadership of the Fed of treason because they wouldn't subsidize his fight in the Korean War. Um, I mean, this was a desperate um, uh, moment, not for the Federal Reserve, but for this country's economic policy. Uh, by the way, just a couple of quick round rules. A, a good question at the Kennedy School, uh, of which the first uh, questioner violated several elements, <laughs> uh, is this, it begins by identifying oneself. In this case, since I identified him, that was not a violation. Uh, it is short and contains but one thought, it's probably pretty good. And then it's an end with a question mark, and there's one per customer. So it's that last a little bit. But in this case, it was a good invention. And so if you could identify the yourself, question. Sure. It is the big question. Uh, and Neil Ferguson, uh, professor of history, uh, was blamed or thanked by you at the beginning for having encouraged you to come here. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, a two-parter. I already violated a rule. A, you didn't tell me enough about why central bankers are not judges. At the beginning, you listed the things that have been delegated to other agencies, mm -hmm. uh, taxes to parliament, war making to army, and so on, but you actually didn't talk about judges. And the puzzle really is why central bankers are not like judges. Uh, B, uh, historically, central banks, including the one you worked for for 33 years, exist as the handmaidens of public finance. And uh, from a historian's point of view, periodically, in pe periods uh, of, of peace and stability, it's possible to imagine that they're independent. Yeah. But in any emergency that has major fiscal consequences, their independence is always and everywhere circumscribed. Uh, and under those circumstances, doesn't, aren't you arguing for a Fed Accord? Uh, and a Bank of England Accord, perhaps there's been a Bank of England Accord, to coordinate fiscal and monetary policy in the wake of this latest fiscal crisis, not caused by war, or at least not much, but nevertheless creating just the same sorts of problems as existed at the end of World War II. So let me start with the um, second. Um, basically, I agree. I think when one gets to war um, conditions, the, the executive branch and the legislature decides that if you like, they have inflation, they finance, um, then you just suspend central bank I do not think it is fine for them to suspend the rule of law. Um, and I think that if I don't go through the argument in a deep sense, I do think the rule of law is more fundamental than what we're talking about. But, and um, uh, I was conscious of overrunning, so I didn't say this, I think there is a parallel with the judges, and it's one that weighs with me greatly. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago when the central banks had fewer powers. If you think about the top judges, it's true in this country, certainly true in countries in the 1940s. Um, when they retire, they retire. They don't go on to anything else. This isn't, um, this isn't a move in a career game. They serve as Supreme Court judges and as appeal court judges and then disappear into the, into the night. And they serve long terms um, as well, which is, which is good. And I think this is a real challenge. They are so powerful now. If you think just about the Federal Reserve, the Congress says that um, the governors have terms of 14 years and they can't be removed other than the cause. And the chairman is um, renewed every four years and actually the president can get rid of um, the chairman um, on at a low threshold under the law, not the um, convention. I mean, in fact, people um, serve as governors for um, just a few years. Jeremy is coming back here, just two years. Well, I can tell you the way the Federal Reserve works, the staffers, the chief staffers work for the chair um, because the other people are passing through. Now, and this is not what um, Congress envisaged. And it is, more importantly, it is completely 
they serve in this country to go on, there's no age limit at all, so they probably go on too long. Um, but I, I wonder, I think this will be a big change in culture, um, but I wonder about that. They are so powerful. Shouldn't they serve for quite a while and then do nothing? I'm Ben Friedman from the Economics Department. I wonder, Paul, whether many of the aspects of this debate that you have emphasized are really derivative from the one of Alberto and uh, Tavolini's principles that you mentioned but didn't really emphasize, and that's the distribution yeah. aspect. Yeah. Uh, it looks as if in the current climate, what has made all of these issues like accountability and transparency so contentious is the widespread perception that whether necessarily or not, what the Federal Reserve did and is doing has very first magnitude distributional consequences whether viewed in the large as you did about between savers and other people, whether viewed in the uh, somewhat smaller between the share owners of banks and the management of banks, whether viewed in the much smaller than that having to do with the executives of financial firms just uh, taken in and of themselves. Alan Greenspan said not privately, but in a talk that he gave at uh, the Brookings a few years ago, that he was not aware of even a single financial executive who had either gone under personal bankruptcy or lost his house yeah. in the crisis, yeah. which obviously is a big, cr a big contrast to the experience of millions of Americans. Yeah. And I wonder whether by drawing this separation that you did in which there are these matters having to do with accountability, uh, stepping over various lines, being predictable and so forth, and all of this uh, stuff that we economists love to talk about a lot, uh, and treating that as separate from the, uh, the Alberto principle that when you really stick it to one group of folks, and you're visibly shoveling money at another group of folks at the same time, the body politic gets, ups gets upset about that. And I wonder whether that's really what's making all of these issues uh, so vital. Well, um, I basically agree. I, and I think there's a high way of level, high level way of thinking about this in a slightly more granular way. The high level way is that we need to think about whether all things So I think help is at hand on, um, on one front, but I think the broader issue you raise is very significant indeed. And were it to be concluded that there are always an unavoidable 
PhD student at the Agamon Strong. And in your definition of an independent agency, you focused on short-term political changes. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? And <coughs> long-term political differences? Not only because the long-term the long-term political choices are about goals. What does society care about? How much do we care about price stability? Um, how much do we want to give the, in, in the case I was talking about, the central bank to s try and stabilize demand um, as well? Th those things are all for uh, politicians. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. So we are now concluded. Have a good evening.